Hey, Northview, it is so good to be worshiping with you today. Psalm 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Right now, we are going to join in in song and message and response into what God has done and what He is going to continue to do in our lives. We are so glad that you are here. Let us worship. amazing and I love coming out of that song into this moment of welcoming you who are watching right now. We would love to connect with you. You can throw your name in the chat box and one of our online hosts will be able to connect with you and welcome you to our, our online service. And there's also a connect card that you can go ahead and you can fill out. By filling out that connect card, you give us the opportunity to connect with you and help you with whatever steps that you might wanna take with us as a church or even in your relationship with Jesus. What's exciting is about this day, we are getting to live in the reality of our three-stranded approach of having church online, in groups, and on site. And we have a group meeting right now in our church building and we are excited about what God is doing 
there in that place, but we are also very excited about what God is doing online and through our groups. In fact, if you want to connect with one of our groups, put your name down there and one of our hosts can connect with you and help you take that next step to find a group that you might feel comfortable with meeting in a smaller environment before maybe you take that next step into our building. We are excited about how God is using these three different opportunities to still have one church that worships the Lord together and that we are moving forward in the direction that God is calling Northview to take. As we continue worshiping, I wanna lead us into a word of prayer and just thank God for how he's been moving and ask God to continue to connect people to his mission. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the ways that you have led us as a church body to this moment. And we are excited to know that you are moving online, that you are moving within our different groups and that you are moving in our building. And we know, God, that you are speaking to us in powerful ways and that you are challenging us to become more like your son, Jesus. We thank you and we pray this in his name, amen. But it won't prosper When the darkness falls It won't prevail Cause the God I serve Knows only how to triumph My God will never fail My God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory
speechless in grace and mercy there is no steadfast never failing you are faithful our creation is in all of who you are you're the healer of the sick and the broken you are comfort for every heart that mourns our king and our savior Sing of all you've done. And for eternity, we will sing of all you've done. Oh, we sing, God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. There is life, there is healing in your love. You're the Father, the Son, the Holy
Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience. Enduring hardship, when called upon to defend and liberate, they said yes. They found courage to rise with every sun, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command, even in the darkest hours, they said, yes. They cherished and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. Pierre Paul Thomas didn't realize it at the time, but falling down a flight of stairs may have been the best thing that he's ever done. As a result of that fall a few years ago, he was able to see for the very first time. Uh, his tumble broke bones all over his face and there was a reconstruction of his eye sockets that had to be done. And several months later, after the original fall, there was an appointment to evaluate the need for further uh, surgeries to fix his eye sockets. And his doctor there at Montreal General Hospital said, while we're at it, do you want us to fix your eyes? Well, the 68-year-old man couldn't believe his ears. You see, he had been blind since birth. He had a congenital issue with his eyes. The optic nerves were damaged. He had cataracts and earlier surgeries and in his childhood had proven to be fruitless. And so they had given up on it and he had lived his entire life, 68 years, not being able to see. So the idea that there was a surgery that could be done to fix his eyes was almost more than he could take in. But he opted to do the surgery, and so they fix his eyes, and for the very first time, he's able to see. And I want you to just close your eyes for a, ma for a moment and just begin to imagine what life might have been like to come out of the darkness that you're now experiencing, that you're now feeling, where, where you're not able to perceive, and you're not able to know, and you're not able to comprehend until you open your eyes and the world just comes alive to you and you're able to see things that you've tried to imagine in your mind, but you've never been able to fully comprehend. That's exactly what he had to experience when he began to see for the very first time. I mean, things like colors. He had heard red, blue, green. But what is red, blue, green? And how does my brain begin to identify what I see and what I know and connect those things together? Or even things like the transformation from one season to the next. He noted that things like buds on a tree were something that he had no concept for and just could not get his mind to get wrapped around until he could actually see it with his own eyes. He, he admitted, though, that there was some of this journey and some of this process that was challenging that it had been so long and so many years without sight that the disconnect and trying to, to, to bring reality and clarity to what he was seeing was difficult and something that he struggled with and has continued to struggle with for years to be able to bring his comprehension and clarity up to what his eyes are seeing. He said it like this. He said, I'm a child all over again and I'm learning and I'm growing and I'm making mistakes but he's chosen to embrace this as an adventure and he's not allowed his discouragement or some of the things that don't come quickly or easily to get him too far off track instead choosing to create every day or treat every day like it's an adventure. You know his story reminds me of one in the Bible in Mark excuse me in John chapter 9. John 9 is a select story. John only tells us a handful of stories from Jesus' ministry, and they're all really, really special. And this one in John 9 is one of my favorites about a man who was born blind, who has this encounter with Jesus that I know he was not counting on on the particular day that it happened. And I know he wasn't counting on it because he wasn't seeking Jesus out. I know in a lot of the stories that we've been looking at in this series, people have been seeking Jesus out. But in this particular story, that's not what happened at all. They weren't seeking him out at all. 
In this particular story, Jesus and his disciples were simply passing this man by. This blind man was sitting uh, on, the, on the side of the road or sitting at the gate. He was a beggar. It was what he could do, and there was not much else that he could do. And he was uh, sitting there, and his disciples come up, and they begin a conversation, not to him, but about him. And there was a belief at the day of the day that if you were blind or if you were suffering in, in an extreme way, that you were suffering because you sinned or your parents sinned. And so a question gets opened up about this man and his condition by his disciples. If you have your Bible and you're in John 9, take a look at it with me. It says that as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, he said. Uh, but this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, and wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and he came home seeing. Again, Jesus is on the move on this particular day. He's uh, not setting up appointments. He's, he's not uh, really able to spend a lot of extended time here. In fact, after this little moment of healing, he just moves on. Uh, from, from this moment. He'd been uh, the day before or the chapter before we see a pretty significant confrontation with Jewish leaders. He, he had identified himself as God. He had identified them as the devil. And as you can probably imagine, that didn't go very well. And he was a wanted man. They were trying to take him out. So he's on the move. But he's not so in a hurry that he doesn't have time to have this moment and to have this encounter with this man. And, and again, mind you, the man never asks for Jesus to do anything. The question is asked about the man and his condition, and Jesus approaches him. And without getting permission, he, he does something that would probably always be a little bit offensive, but imagine it right now in our current circumstance. He, he just takes a step back from the man, and he spits on the ground, wipes with his hand that dirt that's been spit on and now turned to mud, rubs it around on his fingers and makes a paste and puts it in the man's eyes. Now, I don't know how it would make you feel to have someone spit and make mud and put it in your eyes, but it would make me feel very uncomfortable. It would be awkward. It would be very much invading the personal bubble that I have created for myself. It would be unexpected. And, and then to be told to, to go wash off and, and, this, and to go clear, clear your eyes uh, up at this particular pool, Pool of Siloam. But even more astounding that it actually worked. And that this man who had been blind for his whole life can now see. Well, you would think that this is like a party and a celebration, but it actually turns into a whole lot of controversy. Um, this guy can see. He's never been able to see. He can see. But because Jesus is a wanted man and the religious leaders are trying to get him out, the story begins to shift and the attention begins to shift from the man whose eyes were opened to the identity of the one who opened his eyes. And there's some conversation about who did this and why he did this and isn't he a sinner and sinners shouldn't be able to do this. This man whose eyes were open, his parents want nothing to do with it. They back out of the conversation very, very quickly. Uh, they step out and say, hey, he's a grown man. He can answer for himself. And the, the son even has some, some dialogue with them that, uh, that moves from defensive to offensive. He starts off very much kind of being attacked and he begins to get a little more confident as this conversation grows and as it shifts a little bit. But they don't want to have it from him. And ultimately and eventually, they end up just booting him out and say, get out of here. So again, what should have been a celebration, what should have been a happy day, is a very, very difficult day. A very sad day in, in many respects. Because the people that should have been celebrating with him are not. Well, Jesus finds this man. In fact, it says in verse 37, after this whole miracle has gone down, after he's been kicked out, Jesus heard that he'd thrown him out 
And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, the one who is speaking with you is he. And the man said, Lord, I believe. I believe. In other words, Jesus says, you're looking at him. You are looking at him. When Jesus had put the mud in his eyes and sent him away, he obviously couldn't see who Jesus was. He couldn't have identified him. When somebody asked, in fact, later, who was it that did this to you? He goes, I don't know. I was blind. But now he can see him. He can see him with his own eyes. He's been healed both physically and spiritually. He's identified Jesus as Lord of his life. You know, this is one, as I said, of seven miracle stories that John tells in his gospel. Each one of them is significant. And each one of them is not just a story that, uh, about, about uh, a particular miracle that Jesus performed. It's about something bigger. It points to something even bigger in the kingdom or in a, about a relationship with God that is significant for all of us to grab a hold. And I think his story, this story of this man, brings us to, to grab a hold of at least a handful of spiritual principles that are true, as true today as they always have been. And here's the first one. It's that seeing Jesus clearly often comes in stages for people. It often comes in stages. It doesn't always come at once. It can come as a process and over time. Uh, there's a, if you were to read all 41 verses of this story, you will see this young man move from a position of trepidation to a place of great confidence, not just in himself, but in who Jesus is. In fact, the very first time that he is asked, who did this to you? He says, that man they called Jesus. That's in verse 11 of John 9. That man they called Jesus. Doesn't sound very personal. It's somewhat disconnected. He's been told that's who it was, but he's never seen him with his own eyes. He's not fully 100% confident that that's exactly what happened. That man they called Jesus. After a little more dialogue, they ask him, well, who do you think he was? And the man says, I think he was a prophet. And then by the end of the story, we get this in verse 38, where he says, Lord, and he calls Jesus Lord. He goes from that man they call Jesus to Lord. He didn't start with Lord. He started at, at the beginning of even just like kicking the tires on this whole faith idea. Kicking the tires on who Jesus was and what he was about and the significance of him. He started to gravitate towards, I think he might be a prophet but it finished with conviction and certainty. He opened my eyes and he is the Lord. You know, when we come to Christ, we have, uh, in a similar way, we experience a progress or a progression in our faith. Very rarely does someone have a single moment where everything all comes together at once. It's a series of, of, of time where God begins working in our hearts and he begins kind of honing in our spiritual vision of who he is. It's kind of like going to the eye doctor and, and how you start off with everything really blurry and then little by little, they start to bring it into focus. They start to bring it a little bit sharper. Seeing Jesus clearly took some time for this guy and it often takes some time for you and I. So if you are struggling in this moment to see Jesus as clearly as you would like to, know that this story is not done and that God's going to continue to reveal. If there are people in your life who aren't seeing Jesus as clearly as you wish they would, know that the story's not over, that he's still moving, and that often he works in a progression. And as it comes to our own personal life, sometimes we see this as a great encouragement, and sometimes this is a great discouragement that seeing Jesus clearly doesn't come all at once, that it comes in phases or stages. And I just want to encourage you to know that this is one of the great joys of the Christian life and of, the, of, of believing Jesus and, and walking with him is that he continues to draw, to draw near to us and he continues to show us each day a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more of who he is. And that's why I would encourage you in your journey to always be asking yourself this question, what is my next step? 
Just assume that you don't have it all figured out or that you don't see Jesus as clearly as you need to yet and that he has more that he wants to show you, more that he wants to reveal to you. And treat your life and even some of the mistakes or frustrations or wrestling as part of the adventure of knowing who Jesus is and what it is to be a fully devoted follower of his. I actually love it that this guy kind of works through a day with Jesus and moves through this progression. It's kind of a a microcosm of of what it is to be a believer in in a whole lifetime. It moves and it progresses over, over time. This miracle did for this man exactly what it was supposed to do. It started a relationship. It didn't finish the relationship. It started it. That was all this was supposed to do. It was supposed to start a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. And that's exactly what it did. But when that relationship started, admittedly, not everything was known or understood. How did this man begin to see some things a little more clearly about Jesus? Well, this is where I want to draw some attention to a part in the story that I think is, is to me, a little bit humorous. And it touches on the idea of obedience in a significant way. See, Jesus tells this man, after he puts the mud on his eyes, to go to the pool of Siloam and wash it off. This is unique to me because there's a lot of different places that he could have washed off or even just wiped it off right there on his own. But he chose not to do it. Jesus had a particular path and a particular plan And he followed it to a T. And here's what I want to say about that. I think this is the second major principle that comes out of this story. Obedience brings blurry faith into focus. This man was invited into this miracle in a participatory way. God had all the power that he could possibly want. He had the power in that moment to not connect his miracle to this man's Uh, behavior, but he chose to do that. He chose to connect the two so that there was a place for faith, that there was a place for obedience. And this man simply just had to obey. This is one of those stories that so perfectly illustrates uh, core value number three here at Northview, which is simple obedience. That sometimes God gives us directives or he calls us into things in our lives that don't feel like it's something that we would want to do or something we should need to do or have to do. But often it's when we follow Jesus to a T. We take him at his word and we live life exactly how he's called us to live. That a faith that's a little bit fuzzy and blurry begins to get more and more focused in. It's true of this man and it could be true of you in your life. In fact, I want to ask you to think about this in your life right now. Where are some areas in your life that you might feel God calling you to do some things that aren't naturally or normally the things you would just want to do? But you've been told this is God's way and this is his will. And there's even promise and blessing attached to this that if you live this way, you will be better for it. That your faith will become clearer and more defined in doing so. You know, maybe it's in areas of sexual purity or personal finance. Maybe it's forgiveness that needs to be extended to somebody or evangelism and sharing your faith with somebody else. These are like all things that you know. These are good things. This is the life that God calls me to. And yet sometimes we feel like, gosh, is there a different way though? I mean, is there a different pool closer to here? Is there somewhere else? that that I could go. In fact, I think it's kind of humorous that Jesus leaves him to go find it on his own. Sometimes it feels like that in our lives. Like, can I get a little more help? And yet in those moments where we feel like sometimes God isn't right there with us, it's that he's partnering and, and letting us experience this thing with him. He's calling us to obedience. And the more that we obey and the more that we trust, the more that we submit the more clear our vision of God becomes. Listen, when, when you sit down in that chair at the eye doctor, and I've had to do it for years now, going back to sixth grade, and I remember the first time I sat in that chair and they put that apparatus in front of my eyes to try to figure out what my prescription is. They start honing that thing in and it starts really, really blurry. 
But by the time they get it all dialed in, you have a perfect prescription and your eyes can see perfectly clear. And I've just had to accept now for 25 years that I have to have corrective lenses. There's just no way around it. There's no way around it. If I don't have corrective lenses, I will not be able to see. I don't even like to use the term corrective lenses, but that's what it says on my driver's license. Corrective lenses required. It's just this subtle jab that your eyes are broken and that you need to be set right or else you're not fit to drive. Guys, in the same way, you and I are broken and left to our own devices, we will not choose what's best for us or what's best for the people that we love. Jesus has come to give us the fullest life that we could ever imagine. And sometimes he invites us to do things and to obey him in ways that we don't at first glance want to do. But the more we submit, the more we trust and the more we obey him, the clearer faith becomes and the clearer we see. And when we see him more clearly, here's what happens. This is the third principle. Our opened eyes don't just see, they speak. They speak. They just start talking. I remember the, the first time I, I came out of that eye doctor after going years of, of, of faking eye exams so that I didn't have to wear glasses. I'd needed them for a long time and I finally caved and was like, I gotta have these. All of a sudden I put them on and the world around me just opened up. It's happened again over the years as I've gone back to get prescriptions changed. Sometimes I'll go a long time and go, ah, we don't need to change it or we don't need to change my glasses prescription. And finally I do. And I walk back outside with those on and it's like, wow, the whole world comes alive to me. And it's, it's not just something that I see, it's something that I say. I talk about it. I share. I can't help but share it. If my wife is with me, if my kids are with me, the, the new things that I'm seeing, I cannot help but talk about. It's, it's one, of the, one of the incredible things about sight. It's the same way in our spiritual sight. In fact, this man has a great, this blind man has this incredible conversation with the crowd and the religious leaders who want to pin him in this moment in some sort of theological trap because they want to know who healed you. And was he of the devil? And was he a sinner? And he says in this really incredible uh, John 29, 25 moment, he says, listen, guys, let me just cut to it. Here's, here's what I know. Who did this to me? What he looks like? Where he came from? I can't answer any of that. Here's what I know. I used to be blind. Now I can see. All of a sudden, in a one-sentence testimony, this man just turns the tables on his questioners because his eyes have been opened to a place that he has confidence to stand up for what he's seeing and what he's experienced because he's the expert of what Jesus has done in his life. It's a great message for you and I to lean into. Sometimes we get too wrapped up in thinking that, you know, to be a spiritual leader or to be somebody that's going to make an impact in the kingdom of God, uh, you, you got to be on a screen like this and you got to be talking to people like, like I'm doing to you right now. You got to be a preacher. You got to go to, you got to go to Bible college or seminary. You got to have all these years of, of a perfect life. And you, none of that is true. And this guy's life story proves that. All you have to do is tell people what Jesus has done for you. Maybe even in a single sentence like this guy did. I was blind and now I see. I used to doubt, but now I believe. That was my story. That's my testimony. God has rescued me and saved me from my sins and saved me from my unbelief and has opened up a life that no matter how hard I would have tried to create would have left me wanting. But his life for me and his purpose and his mission for me has been established and I've been encouraged and I've been full of hope for decades since the moment that I gave my life to Jesus. And I've become an expert in what he has done in my life. I've traveled around the country doing that as best I can, simply sharing, this is what Jesus has done for me. So I wanna encourage you today to think about your journey with Jesus. Maybe it's at the very, very beginning. In fact, maybe you're watching this online because somebody sent you a link and you're not even sure why you're still tuning in at this point. But maybe, just maybe, there's something going on in your heart 
And there's a part of this message that you're hoping is really true. And that maybe like this blind man in the story that Jesus might have time to stop in his day for you. Maybe for some of you, you're having to wrestle with the fact that I'm not sure if I'm willing to let him put mud in my eyes and tell me to go do something that's against my will. I don't know if I'm ready to obey fully. Maybe you're hearing and seeing in the testimony of this man in this story, maybe I should think differently about it because there's incredible life change on the other side. Maybe there would be hope for me that I could get cleaned up, that I could wash and that I could go home seeing as well. Because that's what's great about Jesus. And that's what's great about stories like this in the Bible is they're not just stories of what was, they're stories of what could be, what is happening right now in our midst for those who choose to believe. What is your next step? Where is it that God is calling you? Where are you in this journey that God has you on? And how is he wanting to use you in the next days? Church, as we ponder the great reach of our Lord who can come into our lives and can reverse our blindness and allow us to see, who can take our lives that are pointed seemingly in darkness and without hope and can open them up and show us new horizons, I pray that in Jesus that you find a limitless, a limitless encouragement that even if you've not experienced it to this day, that the story's not over and that there's new life still to be lived out in front of you. I want to encourage you that if right now feels like a struggle and faith feels like a struggle, that sometimes even when our eyes get opened, it's not all perfect and it's not all easy. I take you back to the story of Thomas at the beginning. Even after his eyes were opened, he still had a lot to learn. He still had a lot of growing to do. His, his brain had to comprehend some things that yours and mine have taken for granted a long time ago that we understood. But what if like him, we chose to look at every day, maybe even our failures or our struggles as opportunities to learn and to grow and to change. Guys, that's the life that Jesus is inviting you and I into today. And that's the life that I'm praying that you will embrace. Pray that God can open your eyes and can show you that whole new life today. Heavenly Father, we we love you and we thank you. And we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for the change that he brings, for the hope that he brings, for the help in our times of need. Lord, I ask that today, as we begin to share in just this, this moment with you, Lord, that you will right now begin to open our eyes to the spiritual realities that are all around us, that you will help us to understand where it is that you want us to be, that you maybe will tap on our heart a bit, open up those doors that we have left closed for so long, Lord, that we'll invite you in so that you can make us more like you. But we want to move in our followership of you from doubt to faith, from kicking the tires and and confused to fully devoted and convinced and convicted. Lord, take us on that journey. Help us to grow closer to you in this time. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. like lightning I saw darkness run for cover but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven my praise belongs to you forever this is my
my testimony from death to life. Cause grace we wrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. Sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed with water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Grace we wrote my story, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done greater things Still to come, oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Rewrote my story, I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. Oh, I'm alive. What a great day of worship this has been. I love the progression of the message into this song where we are crying out to God, this testimony that he has done. In fact, I love the lyrics of this is my testimony from death to life. And it says, because grace rewrote my story, I will testify. And, and the progression has been of listening, of responding in song, and now we get to respond in action. And the very first action that we can respond with as we think about what Jesus has done in our life is we get to respond with generosity. And generosity is a time where we think of what Jesus has done in our lives, the way that he has blessed us, and we give back. And we give back to God in such a way that it changes our heart, it changes our lives because he has rewritten something in our life. And we want to see that same story being told over and over again, all throughout this county, all throughout this country, all throughout this world. And so church, we wanna invite you to join us in this moment of generosity. You can go to northviewchristian.org slash give. You can give on your uh, church app. You can give by sending a check in the mail. But this act of responding to what Jesus has done in our life is a way of bringing him worship and praise. Another way that we get to respond is by responding through a time of communion. Communion is a time where we set aside a piece of bread and a cup of juice and, and each of those two symbols represents Jesus' body that was broken on the cross and his blood that was poured out. And this is symbolic and this is powerful for us as believers in Jesus because it 
tells us the story of what Jesus did on the cross and how he loved us so much that he came to this earth and he died for our sins. And so today, as you take communion by yourself or with your family, know that you are acting in this great story of what Jesus has done, that he loves you, that he has paid for your sins, and that you are forgiven, and that you can live life starting now in this great kingdom that God has created. Thank you.